Hey guys, here's an update on those radios I picked up last weekend. I've been doing my homework and it's kind of a mixed bag. First up, it's the Philco 70, which is from about 1931. Good news is the chassis is in excellent condition. It even has five out of seven of the original Philco tubes. They have a nice little paper label on them that says Philco and it's a cool globe design. Here's the two that aren't original. I stuck a, an Arcturus tube in there because they look kind of cool. The blue glass and a Cunningham uh, audio output tube. Underneath, it's in really good shape as well. Uh, only thing I've seen repair-wise are just two new capacitors. The rest uh, looks to be in really good shape, so I've got high hopes for that. But when I pulled out the speaker that was bolted up underneath, up here, it just confirmed what I already suspect, that the cone's completely gone, and it was just being used for the output transformer to feed this more modern speaker. Maybe I'll spend the money to get it reconed, but I think it's more practical to uh, just look around for a, uh, a Philco speaker in better shape of the same vintage. Next up, the Philco 38.7CS for uh, chairside. Uh, if you recall, there was a record player under here in my last video. Well. Uh, it's not supposed to have a record player. In fact, this is just supposed to be a bare wood uh, shelf down here. No tone arm, no turntable, no switches, and no jacks up here. And it turns out that this is a fairly rare set. They only made these cone-centric radios for one year. And this particular model, they only made about 8,000 of. Uh, so when I asked about it online, um, the consensus was to pull out the turntable, patch in the hole, re-veneer it, and uh, refinish it. So that's what I'm going to do. Here's the old turntable motor, which is actually good. Um, I think it's just a fixed speed of 78 RPM, and it's kind of noisy. And the tone arm is just nothing, nothing to write home about. So maybe I'll put them up for sale on Craigslist or eBay, or otherwise maybe just toss them. The chassis itself is in good shape. Uh, it's a typical 1938 Philco chassis. I've already restored a couple others that were very, very similar. So I uh, shouldn't have too much trouble. The one thing that's very unique about this radio, though, aside from the chair side design, is the cone centric tuning, which uh, I guess you could say is a precursor to push, push button tuning. Um, so um, there's sort of three modes of operation on the, uh, the one mode is you just grasp the uh, the tuning knob here and turn it and you choose the station. Second mode, I'm missing the knob for it, but uh, you could push in on a second knob here and slowly rotate it for a fine tuning mode. And the final mode would be the cone centric action. As you can see there are call signs for various stations around the dial. Well, if you want to listen to one of those, you would use the adder control to get in the general vicinity of that call sign, and you would push in on it, and it would lock in on that station. Uh, what it was, what's actually happening when I do that, I'll show you over here, is there are a series of cones. Uh, let's see, there we go behind this mechanism here. There's two little divots on the head of each cone. Those are for a special wrench to uh, insert into the two pins so you could loosen these and rotate them to the right position and lock them down. So what actually happens is this, when you get into the right the general area of a knob, you push in and there's a plunger that actually fits over that cone. The idea being that if you are off a little bit when you push it in, the plunger hits the cone and, and uh, moves over the, uh, the tuning capacitor a bit to lock down the station perfectly. So, <laughs> you imagine it's a, quite tedious to set these up and uh, maybe not the most practical thing to actually use because it's not really all that hard to uh, find a station on the dial and actually dial it in. But, uh, hey. 
you know, they're kind of certainly an interesting bit of history. Next up, the Spartan 400. I've got the Spartan 400 in my work on my workbench because that's actually going to be the first one that I restore. It's upside down right now, so I can uh, get the uh, all the components underside. Now, unlike the other two, this one has had a fair bit of work done to it. Uh, I think all the original capacitors and most of the original resistors have already been replaced. But the replacements are so old now that they're they're actually in pretty bad shape. This capacitor block, I think, is one of the originals. Uh, it's a bank of 4.3 microfarad caps, and uh, it's like a tower block inside of a metal box. Both the screws were gone off of this. It's supposed to fit in over here. It was just flopping around, and half the wires were cut off. So uh, I imagine it's it's pretty well shot, and maybe was somebody was in the middle of repairing it and uh, gave up. Don't know, but I'll be replacing all of it. Some other repairs. This is supposed to be a one microfarad. They put in a four microfarad. Yeah, maybe for that particular component it doesn't really matter, but I'll be using all the correct values um, uh, for the whole radio. One thing I'm still puzzled about is the volume control. I think I mentioned it in the earlier video. It sure looks original. It's certainly period, um, but it's just a volume control, no power switch. And the other models I've seen online do not have a power switch sticking out of the side like mine does. I'm pretty sure you would rotate the volume and it would turn the radio on. But I've got this switch over here. However, it looks like a very old switch. Old cloth wiring. It's the same color as all the other wiring. But Spartan made fairly high-end radio, so I can't imagine that they uh, would have designed it to have a switch, big toggle switch sticking out of the side of the radio like this. Maybe one of you guys out there has uh, an answer for me. Uh, post a comment online. I'd, I'd really love to hear anything about it. Uh, something else I think I mentioned is that there's supposed to be two um, Type 183 audio output tubes right here. Those are really expensive. I managed to track down one, but uh, uh, I really don't have the money right now to track down others. So I uh, looked up possible solutions online and, f online and found out that uh, a Type 71A is a pretty good replacement. However, uh, it is recommended that you change out this bias resistor. That, uh, it's probably a little hard to read, but it's 1250 ohms, which is this this guy right here. That's how they used to look, kind of a, oh, a, a mashed a cylinder shape. Uh, I replaced that with um, from 1250 I think up to about 1800 or so. Um, I'll post some notes about that. And those two, the, the 71A's have slightly less output power. But uh, <laughs> to save myself a hundred bucks or so for the right tubes, that's fine with me. Uh, I think over the next day or two I will uh, have this set to the point where I can hook it up to a dim bulb tester and uh, and try to power it up and I'll record a video on how that goes. That's all for now.